1944, in Mexico City, a novel, Toten Jäger, Dead Hunter, was published in German by a small press, El Libro Libre. The author was Leo Katz, Austrian intellectual activist and journalist, and above all, a survivor who found in Mexico City a home and had brought his family with him. Friedrich, or Federico as he likes to be called, Leo's son, grew up in the city. Mexico became him as much as he, la uh, as he was also an Austrian survivor, a French educated boy, a historian of ancient and modern Mexico, an educator. In the 1960s, he was teaching Mexican history at the Humboldt Universität in East Berlin. By the early 1970s, after teaching in Mexico and Texas, Professor Katz came to Chicago already as one of the most influential historians of Mexico. Um, here, he has taught generations of historians the saga that Professor Katz embodies, in which Vienna, Berlin, Mexico City, and Chicago blend, has resulted in books and papers that have marked as very few works our understanding of Mexico. <coughs> and it is to this important, yet incredibly modest historian, who I call to introduce Professor Lorenzo Meyer, our first speaker in an exciting year of activities sponsored by, of course, the Frederick Katz Center of Mexican Studies. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mauricio, for, this, for these nice kind words. It is a special honor and privilege to introduce Professor Lorenzo Mayer of the Colegio de Mexico, one of the best most outstanding and most prominent both historians of Mexico and analysts of contemporary Mexico. Let me just read a few of his books. The list is enormous. One of them is Mexico. A classic work is Mexico and the United States in the Oil Controversy, 1917-1942. His book, Su Majestad Britannica Contra la Revolución Mexicana, El Fin de un Imperio Informal, is a wonderful description and analysis of British policy of Mexico, which still leaves me with an open question. How could the British, who controlled such a fantastic and huge empire, send some of those stupid diplomats <laughs> to Mexico? His book, in the shadow of the Mexican Revolution that he wrote together with Hector Aguilar is still one of the most of the best works on 20th century Mexico. One of his more recent books is El Cactus y el Olivo, Las Relaciones de México y España en el siglo XX. And he has editor of a book on contemporary Mexico. It's still a puzzle to me how a man who writes these fantastic books can at the same time write a weekly column for Reforma, host a TV program, all of enormous quality. I envy him for that. I could never do the same. <laughs> Among friends, acquaintances, and many people I know in Mexico, he is also known as the incorruptible. He has never been co-opted by any Mexican regime. He has never accepted any trips or any junkets. And in fact, if I've heard if he is invited to coffee by Mexican politicians, he insists on paying for his own coffee and probably <laughs> even for the cup of milk that's going to. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to welcome him. A man who, in all of his writings, has been committed more than anyone I know, to the cause of democracy in Mexico. Welcome, Professor Mayer. Thanks a lot, Professor Katz. Ah, 39 years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting today, 
and somebody by the name of Peter Blau was uh, here teaching, trying to teach me philosophy of science. Uh, also, he came from Germany, and uh, for the same reasons, Professor Katz. Uh, he gave me a very bad grade, I remember that <laughs> quite clearly, quite clearly. But I, uh, I don't blame him. I was trying to understand what was uh, science and social science and philosophy of science and everything that has to do with science. Uh, and he was not very good temper, uh, so he just like uh, to uh, repeat things. And my English was particularly bad at that moment. If it's bad today, <laughs> can you imagine 39 years ago? Well, uh, <laughs> English was really a problem for me. I came here uh, to the political science department and uh, they told me that history was irrelevant uh, and that um, uh, Latin Americans knew very little about themselves, that Americans were uh, able to know more about Latin America than we were able to know about ourselves. With those two premises, uh, I started my three years here in Chicago. Well, they were tough. <laughs> I'm uh, back today to discuss with you, and it's going to be really a discussion, I hope, uh, what uh, is uh, happening in, in political terms in Mexico uh, after this uh, difficult election that we uh, had just a few months ago. Uh, but before going into the details, uh, I thank you very, very much, Professor Katz's introduction and the invitation of the Katz Center for Mexican Studies. And I also, uh, I'm very grateful to Alejandro Flores because uh, he decided to invite, uh, invite me some months ago. Uh, otherwise, I could not be here. Well, thank you. And now let's start uh, this uh, for me, painful <laughs> uh, recent history of Mexico. Let me uh, see if I can manage this from here. Uh, yeah, this is perfect. You just push a button and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, this, this, uh, no, it's, uh, it comes here. Ah. This place is exactly as I remember, except for this thing. This was not here. <laughs> Fortunately, it is uh, right now. Well, I like this, uh, uh, this f uh, first set of figures because you can see here two things. First, that even uh, in 1976, Mexico uh, used to have elections that even the Soviets uh, didn't dare to, to produce a 100% <laughs> winning. Of course, that, that was a little uh, uh, mistake by the system because they never tr uh, tried to achieve a 100% vote. Uh, but PAN decided not to participate in that election, and that's why uh, it uh, ended up like this. It's the naked nature of the authoritarian political system. Probably Mexico uh, has the dubious honor of having the best authoritarian system in the world in the 20th century. Uh, if this system started around 1916 when the Carrancistas uh, won power in Mexico, it lasted 84 years. Ah, how many European uh, countries, democratic or non-democratic, uh, were able to have this uh, uh, regime uh, consistency and stability. None in Latin America, of course. Africa was uh, not yet independent except for a few countries like Ethiopia in those years. And Asia also uh, had no uh, history like us. I challenged to uh, found another authoritarian system with this consistency. And you can see here also how quickly the decline began 
1988, the election of Salinas de Gortari, uh, this 50.47% of the vote was, of course, uh, a creation, an invention. Uh, Salinas had to confront uh, the problem of a very open electoral fraud in that year. And uh, here we go, down to the year 2000, when uh, at last the state uh, party system is gone, democracy is coming to Mexico, and the last election, Felipe Calderón from the PAN, from the right, won by 35.89%. Uh, so it's just a third of the uh, Mexican voters that are a little bit more than a third that are supporting uh, the present president-elect of Mexico. Well, behind this, it's a, a, a history, especially the, uh, the last two between year 2000 and two, uh, 2006, of a very peculiar development in Mexico. Before the year 2000, we didn't use to talk in left and right terms. It was only pre and the opposition, the democratic opposition from the right, the democratic opposition of the left. But uh, it's really very recently when we began to talk about right and left. And today, that is the main uh, focus of Mexico's political attention. It's a very bitter struggle, political struggle between these two uh, uh, alternatives with something in the middle that is just disappearing. Uh, the, the traditional, the old um, dominant party, PRIM, PRI, that is now uh, with a kind of a crisis of identity. They don't know exactly who they are. They have a long history, political history, but they have a very difficult present and they don't know if they have a future. Uh, so they are now trying to figure out what to do. Basically, they are taking sides uh, with the pan, with the right, against the left. Now, let us uh, see. Uh, here you have the three political parties. Acción Nacional, Partido de la Revolución Democrática y Partido Revolucionario Institucional. See how close they, uh, the, the, the first two are. Uh, they are very, very, very close. Uh, and it was a very bitter election with PRI going probably to, to nowhere, to history. Although they, are, uh, they resent very much when I uh, uh, say that they don't have a future. My God, they uh, get really angry and very nasty with people like me that are saying, how come we don't have a future? Of course the future belongs to us and so on. So, uh, we will be at the center and we will be the solution. I doubt it. Uh, so the, the, the future is this uh, bitter struggle between Partido Acción Nacional and Partido de la Revolución Democrática, right and left. The difference is minimum. And that uh, complicates things a lot. Uh, in, at the present time and in the future. Then let's see the difference here. Uh, here it's a, a, the, the, an interesting point. Representatives and uh, senators, then the difference is huge. Here, just look at PRI and PAN. If both are able to work out an alliance, they will be the ones that uh, can produce uh, the political agenda uh, in Mexico for the next three and six years. And PRD, uh, the left, is left with very little to do. They have a presence in Congress, but they cannot block uh, uh, um, the set of uh, priorities that uh, PAN and PRI are uh, willing to work out. So in this sense, if you look at the presidential uh, results, 
PAN and PRD are very close. But if you look at Congress, where the locus of power is now, then the difference is uh, really meaningful. The left doesn't have the possibility uh, of uh, blocking, of opposing to any uh, important, uh, relevant uh, policy. And, and as I said, Congress is now very relevant. It used to be totally relevant uh, 20 years ago uh, to be a senator, to be a representative was nothing. Everything was centered in the presidential uh, office. Now, at some point, I think that presidents are nothing. Uh, and uh, Congress is extremely important as well as local governments. Probably PRI, the real locus of power of PRI is in the states. Uh, at the local level, PRI is still very powerful. Now, here uh, is what I was uh, trying to, to tell you. PRI has 17 states. PAN, nine, and PRD, only six. Of course, one of these six is Mexico City. This is the most important, of course. Uh, but then it's also Guerrero, Michoacán, that are not particularly relevant in, in national politics. Uh, but here is some, uh, the, the map with these three parties. If you look at this, my God, PRI is really relevant. How come they, are, uh, they have no future? Looking at uh, governorships, but it's uh, very different if you look uh, at the presidential policies and the federal bureaucracy, then they, uh, they are uh, very weak in that uh, field. Now, let's see why I said uh, right and left. Uh, uh, this is one of many, many, many statistics that uh, we can uh, work out and, and uh, present to you. I use this one of minimum salaries. Uh, monthly salary in, in, in the official minimum salary in Mexico. And then you can see that those who have between nothing and three minimum salaries are uh, not overwhelmingly uh, on the left, but the poor are on the left. And of course, the others are on the right and the pre in the middle, uh, but the two extremes are very well represented. If you look at earnings, uh, at the salario minimo, you have two Mexicos here. And uh, this is uh, the, the original map that I uh, presented uh, at the beginning with the title of, the, of this uh, presentation. Here you have two Mexicos. Uh, the north is uh, close to Pan, close to the uh, economic, social, cultural policies of the Pan, and the south uh, is uh, close to uh, PRD. It's a simplification, of course, of what is happening uh, in Mexico now, but this simplification can help a little uh, to understand, because sometimes uh, we need to, to, be, uh, to simplify in order uh, to put many complex things uh, together. And I think that uh, Mexico is, in geographical terms, is two countries from Mexico City to the north, close to uh, the political discourse of Partido Acción Nacional. And if you go to the south, uh, you will find the stronghold of PRD, or used to be the stronghold of PRD, because I don't know what is going to happen in the near future. But this is the picture of the uh, July 2nd of the, uh, this year. Then, this is the problem. This is a big, huge problem. The perception of a, at least 39%, and this is a, a, El Universal um, opinion poll uh, of September 
it's, it's a month and a half ago that uh, this um, opinion poll uh, took place. It's very recent. And here it's the, uh, the, the real problem of the present, that there is at least a minority, but an important minority of the Mexican public that thinks that uh, uh, the election was not fair, that there was something fishy in the election, and that the left lost uh, in an illegitimate way. And so the uh, future political development of Mexico is under this shadow of uh, fraud, something that uh, runs deeply into uh, Mexican civil, uh, civic culture. The idea that there is always somebody using the elections, uh, manipulating the elections, to get a result previously worked out at the highest level. This time, uh, I personally cannot understand the complexity of the of the fraud, if there is fraud in this election. But I have some colleagues in the physics department that are looking at the statistics and said, my God, this cannot be a fair election. But I still, my statistics, I'm not good at that. So I cannot explain exactly what happened. My feeling, it's a feeling, is that a teachers' union had a lot to do with this because it's the most powerful uh, union in Mexico and it's a very authoritarian organization under the leadership of El Baester Gordillo and she was very close uh, to President Fox and his wife that is another important political actor in Mexico uh, or used to be an important political actor like no other wife uh, in Mexico, the present wife uh, is really, really something that we were not uh, accustomed to. She is uh, devoted to power. Uh, she's hungry for power. And uh, this other lady, Elba Esther Gordillo, probably what they did, they uh, control uh, the Instituto Federal Electoral. The president of this electoral board was placed there by El Bester Gordillo. Uh, the um, leadership uh, of this uh, office was thought out by PRI and PAN without the participation of PRD, but especially the president of IFE and some of the key figures in the middle rank uh, of this bureaucratic organization, these huge bureaucratic organizations, organization are close to El Baester. But I still cannot uh, prove that uh, they really uh, introduced some elements that uh, distorted uh, the election. What we know, and uh, everybody knew that, and at the end, the Federal Electoral Tribunal was forced to say that President Fox intervened in an illegal way in the election, using all the power of the presidency and the money of the presidency in presenting uh, the uh, leftist uh, candidate, Andres Manuel López Obrador, as a danger, and that the powerful private sector also introduced itself into the picture at the very end of the campaign and distorted uh, the result of the, of the election. Half a point, uh, you can see if, if the election was so close, with these two powerful machines, the presidency as well as the Consejo Coordinador Empresarial, both uh, um, more than willing to participate in a in not very legal way, uh, the electoral process was then um, t 
tinted with, uh, with um, unfairness. And that is why uh, this uh, graphic is so important, because only half of the population in Mexico believes now that the election was a, a normal a, and not only legal but legitimate a, election. Half of Mexico have some doubts and other a, think that a, this is very, a, that is not a, a, a fair election. Now, let us look a, at the support of democracy, at least in the discourse a, a, in Mexico. Look at the, at the, at the Mexican uh, line. Well, Mexicans are, according to this, in the year 2005, 59% uh, uh, said that it's democracy, the only way out, the only legitimate way of uh, um, producing uh, political leadership and changing political leadership and conduct uh, politics in any way. They are democratic. They almost uh, two-thirds of Mexicans uh, accept democracy as the only way to conduct politics. Okay? And if you compare with the rest of Latin America, we are very, very well. Uh, look at uh, Brazil or Ecuador uh, and uh, uh, Guatemala, our neighbor. They don't think too much about democracy. But the Mexicans say that they are really, truly committed to democracy. OK. Uh, this is by Latino Barometro. Nobody can doubt that Latino Barometro is a, a, is a good institution to measure these variables. But here is the Ministry of the Interior. These, these figures are coming from the Ministry of the Interior. And uh, are you really very satisfied with Mexican democracy? only 25%. So, uh, almost two-thirds say uh, we really love democracy, we support democracy, we are committed to democracy. But when you ask them, this democracy, uh, what do you think about that? Well, then only a quarter of them said it's okay. 21% uh, said, well, no, yes, no, yes. But little satisfied or not satisfied at all is 47%, almost half of the uh, population is saying, no, we are not satisfied. So they support democracy, but they are not satisfied with the, with the democracy they have. Uh, and now, in your opinion, it's, uh, again, the results is, uh, of, um, Last year, uh, but review uh, in August of this year, Mexicans are living in a democracy. Yes, don't know, no, partially, no answer. Only 31% are sure that they are living in a democracy. This uh, kind of uh, uh, statistics are not very encouraging. Uh, only one third are pretty sure that they, uh, Mexico is now a democracy and that they are living in a democracy. But now look at this. Which institutions they trust, uh, Mexican uh, trust? This is Consulta Mitowski, also it's a good one. Look at the three main institutions they uh, think that they trust. They are authoritarian institutions, of course, as you quite know, know quite well, universities are authoritarian institutions. Uh, this is not a democracy. Uh, and the army and the church, well, uh, these are colonial institutions. These three are colonial institutions. And uh, if you look at representatives that are, the, after all, the, the democracy produce uh, the sovereign, the people, have the representatives, and this is the ultimate uh, aspect of democracy. You elect your representatives. Well, do they trust their representatives? N uh, 
it's uh, at the at the at the bottom unions political parties representatives the police a uh, senator president fox uh, is in the middle but what they really trust is universities my feeling is that the majority of mexicans trust universities because they have not been in a university <laughs> they don't know what a university is but they think that there uh, they produce knowledge uh, they are uh, something positive there uh, but they know the army uh, and they know the, the, the church. And they trust more the army uh, than the president and the Supreme Court, senator, representatives, the police. So here you, you have some indicators that there is something uh, that is not uh, going quite well uh, in Mexico. Yes, the majority said uh, that they support democracy, but when they are confronted with the idea of the actual democracy, the, the real democracy, their country, their institutions, uh, they don't trust them uh, that much. And they think that the election, the electoral process was not fair. Uh, so elections are not producing legitimacy, uh, at least for half of the population. Now, this is uh, um, September. Uh, Consulta Mitowski uh, in, in September. As, as you saw at the beginning, the difference between Felipe Calderón and Man Andres Manuel López Obrador between the right and the left was half percent. By this time, the right is, uh, the, the support of uh, um, Felipe Calderón is increasing and the support for uh, Andrés Manuel is decreasing. That's uh, very natural because the loser, you don't want to identify with the loser. And some uh, people want uh, to identify themselves with the winner. Uh, uh, but uh, here is a... Uh, Another uh, problem, of course, the left is losing, uh, the right is winning support, but what is the, the nature of the social system that uh, Mexico has and the, that is uh, embedded in this uh, political struggle? This is uh, income distribution as the most traditional way to look at, uh, at the nature of society. And look how unfair uh, is income distribution in Mexico. As it is in the rest of Latin America. But here then you have a political system that has, uh, that doesn't have the support between 30, 35% of the uh, population they don't support this because they think that the election was unfair. So what we have is political polarization in Mexico in an environment in which social polarization is uh, the most striking feature. At some point, politics can uh, be very useful to link, to, to have a bridge between the have and the have-nots. The political system has enough legitimacy, you can uh, produce political outcomes even in a, uh, in, uh, in a situation uh, like this of, of social polarization. But if you have social polarization and political polarization at the same time, then one is uh, it's a kind of, of vicious circle. Uh, one is supporting the other. Uh, you don't think that uh, the political system is fair because you uh, think that people are, are taking advantage of the poor and the poor resent that. And if the political leadership of the left has a discourse trying to explain this, why is the, this uh, situation? Why it's so unfair? Because uh, they stole the election. 
they wanted to remain with that political uh, system that is uh, extremely unfair because they want to preserve this social situation. Then you have a problem, uh, at least in the short run and probably in the uh, probably even in the medium, uh, something came out of the, well, I don't know, I, if it functions, uh, uh oh, no, it doesn't function. Where is this? Ah, it's here. Let me see. Uh, how do you... It's Okay. Now let me go back where, where I was. Oh. I still had a, another one, but uh, it seems that uh, <laughs> let's see uh, ah, the last one I, I wanted to no that that, that, that uh, I, I I lost a, I lost another one that I I had a, a that I made that picture a, of a, the support of the outside world to this in the past but let's imagine that uh, that it is is there the whole 20th century and the beginning of the uh, 21st century the political support of this, uh, the outside world for this system was a, a, a very strong support at the beginning of the 20th century with the Porfirista dictatorship. Then came the Mexican Revolution. And during the time of the Mexican Revolution, the external world, meaning the United States basically, withdrew its support uh, from, uh, uh, from Mexico, uh, the Mexican political arrangement until the year uh, 1927, when there was an agreement uh, with the, between Calle's government and Washington. And at that moment, the Calle's uh, Morrow Agreement, the support of the United States for the whole range of the, the between 27 to the year 2000, was the open and consistent support of the authoritarian uh, regime. Then came the, uh, the transformation, the beginning of what we thought it was uh, the, electo the, the democratic future of Mexico. And then at that moment, the US and the Mexican government began to have some problems that I couldn't understand at the beginning. Why? Uh, the U.S. government is withdrawing support uh, from this newly uh, emerged Mexican democracy that needs a lot of support. The problem centered around migration. And uh, migration was really, really a, 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 a block, a, a rock in the, in the uh, relationship between these two uh, countries and uh, between the two political systems. And we don't know exactly what's going to be the relationship in the future. So uh, right now, Mexico has the second uh, democratic government with a problem of legitimacy. At least one third of the population is not convinced that this was a uh, uh, a legitimate uh, outcome in the in the election, and the U.S. government uh, is not showing any kind of a clear signal. Is supporting uh, the new government openly and and 
in a, in, in a fair way or uh, it is uh, taking its time, looking at what is happening in Mexico and negotiating uh, the relationship. Now, uh, well, my God, I, I still have other, uh, uh, but uh, believe me, there is another uh, set of, <laughs> of uh, uh, figures there, the economic side of the, of the equation. If you look uh, at the real uh, economic growth of uh, Mexico, since the Second World War to 1982, you will see uh, that it's about 3, 3.5% real, in real terms, per capita growth. Since 1985, 83 to the uh, last year, the average uh, real growth is 0.6. So Mexico is uh, having trouble uh, in its economic development for the last quarter of a century almost. It's not growing. So the, the income distribution is, uh, as I said, very unfair and is not changing, is not really transforming itself uh, in, a, in a positive way. And the process of democratization that started, let's say, in 1968 and especially uh, after uh, um, 1988 and the crisis, the, the political crisis of that moment, the economy is not performing. We have a, a, a real problem that we cannot create enough jobs. So the social situation is polarization. The political situation is also polarization. And the economic uh, development is not, uh, the country is not growing. Vamos a ver. Vamos a ver, because I have a, a nice... Yes. Uh, uh, where is? No, it's here. Let's see. Aquí está, no? eh, vamos a ver, en esas, esas. Vamos a ver, no, vamos a ver, eh, esta, de, esta de aquí. Because this has lots of... Eh, of eh, a ver, Sancho. Um, Let's see, let's see. Mm -hmm. mm, this is a good one. Eh? Identity, eh, crisis postelectoral, identidad partidista. But let me, let me, let me see. Eh, ah, here is a, eh, here is another eh, very good. Eh, I didn't translate this. That's uh, why I. This is a, a, another way of looking at income distribution in Mexico. See how, eh, how unfair. Is this now? How do you uh, square the basic fact of democracy, that is equality in in uh, political terms, with inequality, extreme inequality in social terms? So you need a lot, a lot of legitimacy for the system to function, for people to wait, wait five, ten years. Uh, to produce outcomes that are positive for those uh, at the bottom of society. They have to be very sure that the system is working for them. And it's in that part of uh, Mexican society where the doubts about democracy are greater. They don't think uh, that the outcome of the election was fair, that the dice were loaded against them. So the, the, the and the U.S. Uh, is not sending clear signals. I think that at the end they will be supporting in a more open way Felipe Calderón and uh, the new government because they are very similar. If you look at Bush and you look at Felipe Calderón, 
they have many, many, many things in common. But even today, uh, the US, uh, because of internal politics, because of migration, and migration is a very divisive uh, uh, political issue here, uh, it's, it's withdrawing, it's asking Mexican government to do something about migration, and Mexico cannot do much about migration, because the problem is that we cannot create jobs. And uh, uh, the economic uh, growth is, uh, let me see, let me show you, uh, no, th this is not, uh, this is inequality in, in, the, in the world and Mexico and Turkey at the end. Uh, this is the only way uh, I like Mexico to be part of the, uh, of the Organization for Economic uh, um, Development because uh, by its nature it gave us uh, statistics in comparison uh, with uh, Sweden, Norway and things like that. And uh, we are comparing uh, education and income distribution. And my God, we uh, got uh, a very lousy picture here. Uh, but uh, here it is. Um, here, this is the one that I wanted. Look, during the non-democratic period, during the authoritarian pe period, Mexico was able to grow at a very acceptable rate, 61 to 70, 71 to 80, uh, and then the crisis of 82. And then look, uh, especially this is a, a, a projection of the World Bank. If the World Bank is right, I hope it is not, but I don't have any instrument to say that it's not. Between 2004 and 2015, Mexico is going to grow at less than 1%. Now, how do you manage to, to, to administer this uh, problem of low economic growth, uh, a very unfair income distribution, if you don't have political legitimacy that can uh, make people wait because they trust the, uh, their leadership. But now the leadership has a problem uh, that at least one third or even more than one third are not accepting the, the rules of the, of the game. They, they can uh, now argue that through elections they are not going to get a, a, anywhere, that they are not going to receive a, a fair deal with, the, with this new democratic political system, because it's not democratic at all. So the introduction of this uh, big sign of a question mark about the nature of the Mexican uh, uh, political system can produce in the immediate future a real problem of governability. And if governability increases, and I have some figures about insecurity as, as a one way of looking at governability. Uh, how many, how people react to the sense of insecurity? How many have uh, themselves or their families experienced a problem of uh, security in cities or countryside? Because it's now it's everywhere. Uh, with narco-traffic uh, uh, killings uh, in Monterrey or in Acapulco or in Morelia or in Mexico City. And the sense that uh, something is out of control in regard to security. So if government is not producing security, is not producing economic growth, and you don't trust the political system, what is going to happen in the near future? Uh, and I will uh, leave uh, this open for the, uh, for the discussion, but I'm not uh, particularly uh, uh, positive about uh, the immediate uh, future of Mexico because of this sense, the atmosphere in Mexico is one of resentment, of bitterness, 
on both sides. The right is saying the left is not uh, uh, playing according to the rules and during the uh, election something really uh, that was not particularly wise happened. That the right centered all uh, its efforts not in presenting themselves on their uh, political platform, the positive side, but just attacking the left, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, as a danger to Mexico. They said he is a danger, and by extension, everybody that is around him or support him is a danger. They, they don't belong uh, to, to a... Uh, decent, civilized Mexico. They must be outside. Now, after the election, the political discourse of uh, Felipe Calderón is, well, forget about uh, all these nasty things. We are together. We are one country. We are one nation. We are friends. We are brothers and sisters and things like that. But the left is not buying that because they were a... Uh, uh, blame for something like an anti-Mexican uh, attitude. Uh, they, as I said, the idea was repeated thousands of times a day in the radio and TV. This is a danger to Mexico. This is a danger for the future. Now, the left is saying, uh -huh, we, you thought that we were a danger. We think that you are a danger. Now you are a, a dangerous proposition because of these unfair uh, practices, the unfair election. So we don't want to negotiate with you. We want to create an alternative government. It's going to be, of course, a, a, a kind of a moral counterpart. The government of the left doesn't have any meaning in legal terms, but it has something in moral terms. The left is going to withdraw all support from, uh, from Felipe Calderón and it's going to uh, proceed in a contestatory uh, terms every day. That's the, 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 the plan uh, right now. I don't know if they will be able to generate enough social support to be all day during the whole year and for six years uh, confronting uh, the government. But right now, Felipe Calderón cannot arrive to any place, any normal place, without having somebody shouting him uh, uh, at the entrance of any place. So the atmosphere is uh, of a, a very tense, very confrontational. Uh, nobody is really producing something that can uh, bridge the left and right uh, in, in Mexico. I hope that in the near future something can be uh, changed and perhaps with the passing of time and uh, good negotiations this situation can change. But right now Andres Manuel López Obrador is willing to say that the 20th of November, a very symbolic day because it's the beginning of another anniversary of the Mexican Revolution, he is going to assume uh, his office as the moral president of Mexico. Not the legal one, the moral one. He's going to nominate a cabinet. And the, the guy in charge of uh, Hacienda is going to uh, always point out what they are doing in the economic terms, what they are doing in education, what they are doing in uh, uh, communications, what they are doing in many things. And he will try to diminish the legitimacy of the real government and to have all day confrontations. Again, I don't know if the Mexican society is able, willing to support uh, Andres Manuel because it's going to be a very uh, demanding job. Andres Manuel is more than willing to do that. He has been doing that uh, for many years, so uh, he doesn't have anything else to do. He is he's the, the, the moral leader of the, uh, of the opposition. It's going to be effective? I don't know. 
but it's going to be nasty, yes. Uh, it's going to create uh, and recreate tensions uh, between right and left, something that was not present in the past. In the previous political experience of Mexico, everybody tried to be at the center, uh, away from uh, extremes. Now, it seems that uh, the extremes are uh, uh, the place to be, uh, even if you are in the right or the left. And how are we going to manage uh, this new political situation? I don't know. Uh, I live the daily life of somebody that is trying to observe and try to, uh, to make sense out of this and still cannot uh, be sure of what's going to, to happen. From uh, the right, they said, allow time to dissolve this uh, problem. The left is not going anywhere. And let's try to copt. And cooptation is a very old uh, instrument in, in, in politics, and especially in Mexican politics. Cooptation is really, we are very good at that. Uh, but probably part of the left is going to be coopted uh, because uh, the half of the political leadership of PR, they are more than willing to leave uh, and let uh, leave uh, if they have a, a, a job or something in, in Congress, in, in local governments. But there is another uh, segment that died since it's there that is very angry and bitter and to a certain extent is uh, young people at middle class students, for example, the radical wing of, of the students that always have been uh, there. There is always a radical wing of the student movement that are uh, now engaged in this. But something new that is people coming from uh, the bottom of society, natural leaders that in the past were unable uh, to act because in the authoritarian system, the nature of the authoritarian system is against uh, a social movement, an independent social movement. But now that system is gone. The new one uh, probably is not uh, very democratic, but it's not authoritarian like uh, the old one, and has to allow uh, some uh, political mobilization. Immediately after the election, uh, Andres Manuel asked, in, by surprise, nobody knew this. Uh, in one meeting he said, let us uh, remain uh, here in uh, Mexico downtown and let us uh, use this uh, huge avenida uh, of Reforma and uh, make a plantón there. Bring your tents, uh, bring chairs uh, and sleeping bags and everything and let us remain there as long as we think it's possible. And suddenly this uh, thing happened. How many other social movements uh, is he willing uh, to produce and to be the leader of uh, that kind of protest. To what an extent the federal government is going to tolerate it when uh, it's going to say it's enough and I will use the law against these uh, mobilizations and we will have a confrontation. In Oaxaca, we almost had a confrontation uh, a week ago. But uh, I think that they are going to negotiate the situation of Oaxaca. But Oaxaca is an example of what a social movement in the South can uh, produce. So uh, I will uh, leave you with uh, these ideas. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a, a very well-defined uh, vision of what's going to, to happen in, in Mexico. I think that nobody knows exactly. Not even uh, Felipe Calderón knows how to, uh, to behave on what kind of leader he's going uh, to be. He's trying to reach uh, uh, the center and even the left. And again, I think that some uh, members of the left are going to be willing to cooperate with Felipe Calderón, but not Andres Manuel. 
And as long as Andres Manuel uh, keeps uh, some following, the intensity of that uh, movement is not necessary to have a 30%, 40% of the citizens following Andres Manuel. With 10%, with 5%, we, you can uh, introduce real disturbances uh, in, the, in the system. This aspect of ungovernability. So it's, a, it's an open question, the immediate future of Mexico. But what is not an open question is that the real social problem that we have there has to be tackled by two ways. Rethink the whole uh, economic system and try to produce jobs, even uh, not very well paid jobs. And if the US really builds this uh, huge fence along the border and Mexico is no longer able to send this uh, 400,000 uh, uh, people a year, or even half a million, uh, that there is another uh, calculation. And ex I think it's an exaggeration, but it's important the amount of Mexicans that are coming here. If the door is closed, or half closed, and we don't have a, a redistribution policy, and the political system is not viewed as uh, legitimate and the outcomes uh, of the everyday government in Mexico, governance is not there, then the stability of the country is not assured. And to have an unstable country side by side with the United States and with this idea of the US that uh, terrorism is uh, the main enemy and uh, a southern border that is not uh, completely under control. That can create a mixture of many things uh, that uh, will not uh, provide for a, a bright future. So I will end up my uh, presentation just sending the message to you that there are problems. Uh, uh, on the south side of, of, <laughs> of the border and that the problems are historical in some aspects and are newly created others. Uh, basically the political problems are a new creation. The social problem is very old, very, very old and uh, we have lost a lot of time. Um, so I cannot end up with a positive optimistic note uh, I end up with, uh, again, a uh, question mark. We don't know what's going to happen, but something is going to happen because the old ways are gone and the new ones uh, are very, uh, are not very clear. It's a lot of confusion uh, in Mexico. We don't have an idea of the future, and that's really the saddest thing, because in the past, uh, Mexicans, when the Mexican Revolution was still alive, something that uh, Professor Katz uh, likes to point out, that probably the Mexican Revolution was the last revolution that remained with a sense of uh, purpose and legitimacy. Well, that sense is gone, and we in Mexico don't know what we want to do with our country. Uh, in the near future. We are living day by day, but there is no uh, uh, utopia uh, there. Something that we can say, my God, we have to go there. That's the place we want to be. No, it's uh, the north, the south, uh, the rich, the poor, the right, the left. Uh, everybody has an idea of the future, but is not shared by the others. Uh, and what everybody knows is that there is a lack of leadership. Lack of leadership coming from the political class, from the economic class, uh, from the cultural classes. Nobody is providing uh, 
a sense of a future that is worthwhile. And I will end up my uh, presentation with this sad uh, note, but I think that I'm not uh, exaggerating, and it's better to know what is wrong than to present something rosy. Uh, Gordillo has recently received, uh, I think it's 41 mil millones de pesos for the teachers union. There were allegations about her being involved in fraud. Do you think that this particular sum that has been given to her through the union in order to quell supposedly some of the violence in Oaxaca is tied to these allegations of fraud is my first question. And the second question has to do with the other allegation of fraud, which is the sort of fraud about the election. And oftentimes it's said that there was fraud, there isn't fraud, but yet the PAN took most of the seats in the Senate. They've taken most of the seats in the Diputados, the Camara Diputados. Doesn't it make sense to people on the left to sort of say, well, there is a direct correlation between the seats that were won in the Senate and the seats that were won in the Diputados. Therefore, there is a possibility that Calderón could have won. Is my second question. Well, uh, in regard to 41,000, uh, uh, 41 mil millones, that means uh, $4 billion to El Bester. My God, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the teachers' the, union. The teacher. well, 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 well. And uh, if we look at the statistics about the performance of uh, Mexican students, you will see that 60% of those uh, te the tests were conducted uh, in the sixth grade uh, in the elementary school and the third grade in the, the high school. And 60% of them rank uh, below the minimum uh, average of performance in mathematics and Spanish. So the teachers are not teaching. The quality of education is a disaster. Uh, but this kind of uh, uh, traditional uh, Union politics uh, that is a, a it's a, an inheritance from the uh, uh, from the old regime is still very much alive in the teachers' union, and that is why they thought that the teachers' union were particularly interesting uh, to see in the election because they form a political party. That uh, party uh, the. The uh, presidential candidate of that party received, four, uh, roughly speaking, 400,000 votes. But the uh, candidates for senators and uh, uh, representatives received 1 million point four, uh, one million four hundred thousand votes. What happened with the million? If the senators and representatives receive uh, 1.4, and the presidential candidate of the same party received only 0.4, a million is missing. Where is that million? The possibility is that that million went to Felipe Calderón. And uh, through the, uh, the most traditional way of uh, behaving in uh, labor uh, union politics. And there is also the possibility uh, that El Baester used this particularly uh, um, interesting um, instrument. If you send somebody to stand up in line at 7 o'clock in the morning or even earlier, waiting for the uh, uh, voting place to open, and if there is no president, if, if the selected president of that uh, place didn't show up, the first person in line is, uh, uh, can act as president of that casilla. And uh, the possibility of mobilizing this one uh, uh, million and a half uh, people and, and their families is an interesting possibility. But nobody has been able to really correlate the numbers and the membership of the uh, teachers' union with uh, the electoral performance is just uh, they have the, uh, it's a shadow uh, in the election that that union particularly that, that union that was so close 
to, to the present, so distant from the pre because it's a, a split of the pre, with all the traditional uh, views and attitudes of the, of the priestas, working for Felipe Calderon. I, I asked Felipe Calderon that at the beginning of his campaign, uh, we had a, a, a talk show in the radio, and, and Felipe came and uh, between uh, in a commercial break, I said, Felipe, why are you visiting El Baster? That's your first visit to El Baster, the, the most traditional uh, kind of politician. Why uh, you uh, decided uh, to publicize that meeting? And he said, oh, perhaps it was a mistake. Uh, oh, uh, it's probably it was a mistake. A mistake, my foot. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, my stupidity was so great because they were working together. That's why he, in the first day of his campaign, went to be op the, the official campaign of uh, Felipe Calderón, went to visit openly El Baster. Uh, but again, I don't know uh, what happened uh, there. It's, it's just a premonition <laughs> uh, that I had at that moment, but a wrong one. I thought uh, that. El Bester is going to play a very nasty role here, but you, panista tra uh, of the traditional pan, that are unwilling to do any business with that kind of people, because that's, that was the reason of why pan was uh, created in 1939. Against corporativism, corporative politics was the essence of the, of the pre in 1939 with Cárdenas. And now the remnants of corporativism are located basically in the teachers' union. They are very bad as teachers, but they are excellent as politicians. Uh, uh, that's what we discover. Now, the, uh, the breakdown of the, of the uh, Chamber of Representatives and Senators, you cannot take uh, the numbers as an actual, uh, a direct result of the voting, because uh, there are uh, plurinominales, uh, and it's very difficult. I still don't understand why they assign, but uh, well, the, uh, uh, the general idea is this. You have to create a governability. So the first uh, minority receive a lot of extra seats uh, through plurinominales. So you cannot uh, say how many people voted for senators and representatives, just looking at the figures, because it's, it's a merge of, of direct result of the election, plus these uh, plurinominales that want to produce governability. That's why, if, even if it's just for a fraction, uh, the first place receive a lot. That, that, that's the idea that uh, came in since the 1970s, 1980s, through these uh, six electoral or seven electoral reforms of the time. Um, uh, so it's, it's quite complicated, <laughs> the way in which the, the Chamber of Representatives and the Chamber of Senators uh, is, uh, is formed, really is not a direct result of the voting uh, process. the PRD uh, a party on the left. Sh surely, just because you're not on the right, doesn't mean you're on the left. And if you're a party whose ranks are full of old priestas, uh, priestas de la vieja guardia, you're, you're, you're not, it doesn't mean you're a party on the left. Why not call things by their name and accept that in Mexico, the main Mexican parties, there is no left. That all we have is this, Remolacha, old priestas, paristas, and perredistas, and and accept that there is no left, and maybe that's a good starting point. So <laughs> a possible creation. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a good point, but uh, the left is what what it is. Every country at every moment in history, for example, I can say that Juarez was the left uh, in the 19th century. Of course, he was a liberal, and he was not a socialist. Uh, but it's a, it's. A, is the left you have. We have a very awkward left. The low quality of the left is uh, splendid in Mexico. But it's the left that we have. It's, uh, and I, I, I had a, a here um, one of these uh, uh, quadros show how 
people are now willing to say I'm from the left and I'm from the right. Those who voted for uh, PRD call themselves the left. And especially since the Soviet Union is gone in smoke uh, and uh, there is no common term and there is no international uh, organization of the left that can de decide you are on the left and you are not. Uh, the left is what they say they are. Uh, I, I agree with you that the quality is very low, but it's the left that we have. And in this moment in which uh, things are very, um, probably it's a good idea not to have those clear cut divisions of the past. And of course, if you look at the left in Mexico and you look at the left in Chile, you say, my God, uh, why, why we are having this kind of persons here where uh, look at the Chileans, brilliant, uh, perfect, decent, uh, corruption proof uh, and look at these guys uh, they are a disgrace but well that's the left we have it's a disgrace but that's the left so i prefer i can understand better mexico saying this is the left i don't like it but it's the left and that is the right they don't like to be called the right oh of course they not but who is always saying that there is no left or right it's the right that is always denying the, the, this division uh, between left and right. There's no, 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 there is no right. It's some, uh, we are almost all in the center. But when they go to the voting place and they, uh, they were asked uh, here in some point I have uh, here, those who are more willing to say that we are from the uh, left are those voting for PRD. They themselves call the left. The right, mm, they don't like the idea. Professor Mayer, it struck me that, um, that even though you mentioned that um, you had like no proof, no smoking gun that there was a fraud, that you had a hunchy feeling, and you, you know you can see certain connections between you know the union and the IFE, etc., etc. Um, it strikes me that even in, uh, even in the case you said that you were basing this argument on a hunch and a feeling. You chose not to entertain the other possibility that perhaps there was no fraud. So I wanted to ask you, you know, just for the sake of a, you know, intellectual impartiality, okay. to okay. entertain the other possibility, and then, uh, you know, ask us if the result is reliable. How come the left lost? Uh, okay, let us suppose that there was no fraud, but uh, the electoral tr tribunal, in their final uh, statement, said. Two things. President Fox illegally used the powers of the presidency to favor one candidate. Of course, it was not Andres Manuel. It was the other guy. Uh, so they accepted that in its illegal terms. Huh? Second, the private uh, enterprise, the organization called Consejo Coordinador Empresarial, used uh, TV time and money in an illegal way to favor one candidate. These two things together, suppose that there is no fraud. But during the campaign, there was not a fair play. Uh, the power of the presidency in a country like Mexico, even today, in the year 2006, is not uh, uh, President Salinas or President uh, Cárdenas that reached that point between Cárdenas and Salinas in which the presidency was really powerful, is it still the most powerful of all political organizations? Is it still very important? So the president openly cited day by day using all sorts of languages that could be translated instantly. Uh, don't vote for this guy. And uh, probably in the US, a president can be part of the, uh, of the campaign, but we are not the US. We are a very newly born democracy that has not really created enough roots where everything is in flux uh, and uh, we don't have these 200 years of tradition. We have 200 or more years of authoritarian tradition and the presidency was part of that authoritarian tradition so uh, it was almost uh, natural for a democratic president to remain aloof, to remain impartial. Fox decided not to. 
Not to since he began the impeachment of Andres Manuel. You, don't, you cannot forget that. For a, opening a, a, a street, going to a hospital, uh, they uh, send the whole machinery of the presidency against Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to impeach him. So uh, add two plus two, and at the end it's four. Uh, if you see the president since, 2003, 2004, systematically trying to use the powers of the presidency against Andrés Manuel López Obrador. The atmosphere, the sense that it was an unfair election, is what produced the statistic that I saw uh, that I show you. Now, why uh, in a in a country with such a concentration of income, such a concentration of power, the Consejo Coordinador Empresarial decides at the last moment, the last days to go in a blitzkrieg uh, in television against Andrés Manuel López Obrador. And at the end, the difference is half percent. Do you think that the presidency and the Consejo Coordinadora Empre Empresarial didn't influence the outcome? And uh, the, electoral, the electoral tribunal said, yes, they influenced the outcome, but we don't know how much. So the election remained legal and uh, not perfect, but the, uh, the results are legal. That's the, uh, the, the uh, electoral tribunal decision, but the feeling in the population, at least those who are consider themselves to the left, they say, no, this is not a way of gaining power. Elections are not meaningful. And that's a problem because uh, the left cannot uh, now resort to revolution like in the past, uh, armed revolt. But if elections are not uh, the, the best way, and armed uh, revolt is out of context in this uh, 21st century, what else uh, do you have? Social mobilization. So what we saw in Oaxaca, what we are still looking in Oaxaca, probably will be repeated in other places, not with the same intensity, probably less or even more. But uh, social movements are now the only instrument left to the left. Uh, and uh, they have a leadership that is willing to experiment with this uh, instrument. Now, what's going to be the end product of this? I really don't know. Please. Professor Mayer, it's really great to see you. Uh, I, uh, I have three questions. Only three? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, maybe the shortest one is, what is the relationship between the movement in Oaxaca and, uh, and the, uh, I mean, the, there doesn't seem to be an obvious relationship at first sight between the social movement in Oaxaca and the result of the election. Or yeah. the, the, or the PRD and the You are right. So that's, mm -hmm. that is my one question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my second question is, um, is very related to what you were just saying. Um, it was recently said that the important changes in Mexican history have not come through elections. No. That's Except all, that's all in the here. year 2000. Yes. But, uh, but Andres Manuel said this in an interview with the Financial Times a few weeks ago. And so my question is, is unrelated to what, what he said or didn't say. What do you think is best for Mexico? Um, if you have on the one hand the possibility of destabilizing the system but trying to re-vindicate an injustice that, that, that the left thinks was done, was done to Mexico, and, and on the other hand, just accept the bitter, um, uh, the bitter um, flavor of, of defeat, maybe unfair defeat, for the sake of preserving institutional stability with the possibility that in the future the left might have another shot at winning. So th these are two different approaches. What do you think is, is best for Mexico? And, uh, and the third question maybe I will ask later. Okay, the Oaxaca, uh, the, the, the Oaxaca problem is not directly related to, to the elections. It's re related to teachers' union politics. And Section 22 uh, that uh, is uh, the one that dominates Oaxaca is not very close to El Baster, quite the contrary. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, uh, 
it's a local uh, problem that the Oaxacan governor mismanaged. Why uh, he, uh, in something that was coming to uh, like a kind of ritual, every uh, summer the teachers camp in, in Oaxaca asking for a uh, reasonification that means more money uh, for them. Although they are very bad teachers, but uh, they have this organization, they have political power, they go to Oaxaca, they put the tents and uh, they remain there several weeks and that's it. And you promise something to do something in the future and that's it. But this time the governor sent the police and just for a brief moment the police began to win. But something happened. Uh, nobody has been able to tell me exactly what happened. But at some point, the tents uh, are uh, made with sticks and pieces of, uh, uh, of, of steel. And for some reason, some teachers began to use that against the police and the police retreated. Ah, that was the moment. So the police can be defeated. Yes, it can. And they put a fight and the police just left. So it was a victory. And at that moment, all their organizations in Oaxaca City, basically in Oaxaca City, joined the teachers because they won. They were just looking at the teachers. Look, if they are defeated, it's a pity. Uh, um, but such is life. But they won and they hated the, the, the governor because the governor had... Now that it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. The authoritarian system collapsed, but at the local level it flourished. Because in the past the president was able to look at every one of the governors and put a limit to their authoritarian instincts. But this time there is no limit. Fox, by law and by personality, is unwilling to touch uh, the, the governors. So governors like Ulises Ruiz that are an aberration, it's, uh, they belong to an old age. They are really dinosaurs. They just flourish. They don't have uh, to fear anything. And this coalition that was not perdista, Andres Manuel López Obrador didn't say anything about uh, uh, Oaxaca, just remained silent. They themselves organized and began to be the government of Oaxaca. Put uh, barricades in, in the most, it's like the French Revolution, uh, uh, barricades, um, the, the firearms are really a, a something to, to take that into a museum. It's a, a long uh, steel tube, you put a, a, a cuete, there but those that goes in the in the festivities and direct it against the police and it's like a small grenade uh, you can't really kill somebody with that eh? put just the the tube the cuete with the varita <laughs> and uh, they are they have now those weapons and they are they have their organization they have the radios uh, the cellular phones and organized 24 hours, uh, the, the government of, well, sort of, uh, uh, government in, in Oaxaca. It's a popular revolt in Oaxaca that has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with PRD at the beginning. Now at the end, uh, there is a kind of, of alliance and the government doesn't know what to do. Uh, for a while, the, the, the negotiation was going on while Felipe was in his first trip abroad. They said, well, while he's abroad, solve the problem. No, the problem is still there. And Felipe returned to find that the problem is still there. Uh, now, uh, the second question, what to do? Wait another six years. Another six years uh, in, a, in a situation with a social cleavages, such as uh, the ones I, in a very simplistic way, I, I, I show you. You really wait another six years? And what if there is another uh, attempt to repeat the same thing? Uh, you, you don't have an, in, in, a, in a civic culture that is full of distrust, full of distrust, you don't trust uh, the other fellow. 
Are you sure that at the end of the six years, uh, he's going to change? He's going to behave like a gentleman? Uh, and this time, the election will proceed in a normal way? Or he's going to, to, to repeat in a better way what they did this time? They use a campaign of fear. They introduce fear. And the left didn't, uh, well, didn't react for a whole month. It's only at the end that this daily doses of fear was on the TV and on radio and press. The press is unimportant because nobody reads uh, the press in Mexico. But the TV, <laughs> they see it quite widely and the radio. So you have day by day by day by day this idea that he's a danger to Mexico. He's a Chavez. He receives money from Chavez. And you don't know. Uh, in, in this kind of informal uh, distribution of news, it, it was amazing. They said that if you have a house with a, uh, a ceiling uh, made of uh, um, cemento, how do you say cemento? Well, concrete, they will take that house and distribute to the poor. So it was an atmosphere like in, 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 in the, the Cold War, worst nightmare. The children are going to be sent to separate school. Your house is going to be taken. Chavez is going to uh, reemerge, and Chavez himself is going to be invited to Mexico. What? And uh, Andres Manuel remained silent for a whole month until he began to uh, very late. Uh, so, who is going to trust the, the, the right? And now you have this new uh, development project, the 2030. Uh, Felipe Calderón is going to produce a political platform uh, from here to the year uh, 2030. So, they are more than willing to, to tell you we are going to remain here for a long time. Uh, so, the left. Uh, what is left of the left uh, today, they will, I'm pretty sure that they will try to copt part of it. The other is thinking and rethinking what to do through social movements. Uh, and uh, we really don't know what's uh, going to happen because if the, the El, uh, Oaxaca is an example, fortunately they didn't use uh, violence, but uh, in San Salvador Atenco they use it. Uh, and look at the outcome of San Salvador Atenco, uh, the international uh, human rights uh, commissions and observers that have gone to Mexico and that are now, it, it was a week before, uh, yeah, the past week, uh, weekend, saying, well, there were violations of women, uh, there was systematic violation of women taken uh, um, by the police in, in that uh, action. And nobody has uh, been blamed using the same tactics that uh, the, the traditional authoritarian uh, system. We thought that that was something of the past. So uh, I have my doubts that uh, you are asking too much uh, for the left to be a saint. Almost uh, St. Francis, wait and uh, wait for the justice to come in a millennium. No. Uh, they. Some of members of the left are not willing to wait because they don't trust the upcoming. Thank you very much. Thank you.